Just 15 years ago, one of the best loved and most popular singers of his time was killed in an air raid on London. Tonight, with Gramophone Records and the help of some of his friends and associates, we present some memories of Al Bowley. It's a lovely day tomorrow. Tomorrow is a lovely day. Come and feast your tear-dimmed eyes on tomorrow's clear blue skies. If today your heart is weary, if every little thing looks gray, just forget your troubles and learn to say, tomorrow is a lovely day. Just forget your troubles and learn to say, tomorrow is a lovely day. Those words by Irving Berlin aptly sum up the happy-go-lucky, optimistic outlook and character of Al Bowley. You've just heard him described as one of the best loved and most popular singers of his time, and that's so true. In the 30s, the critics described him as Bing Crosby's most dangerous rival and Britain's answer to Bing Crosby. Not that he sang like Bing at all, far from it, although the easy, casual manner of his singing was, shall I say, in the Crosby idiom. And, of course, Al Burley was as versatile as Crosby because he, too, tackled a wide variety of songs. Meadow and lane, birds on the waving ball. Eatling cliffs by the surging main, rich red loam for the plow. Devon's a fount of the bravest blood that braces England's breed. Her maiden says, as the apple bud, and her men are men indeed. When Adam and Eve were dispossessed of the garden hard by heaven, they planted another one down in the west. Was Devon, was Devon, glorious Devon. First of old world heroes wake by river and cove and cove. Granville, Hawkins, Raleigh, and Drake, and a thousand more we know. To every land the wide world or some slips of the old stock roam. Leal friends in peace, dread foes in war, with hearts still true to home. Old England's counties by the sea from east to west are seven, but the gem of that fair galaxy is Devon, is Devon, glorious Devon. Glorious Devon, usually associated with Edwardian full-voiced baritones, but sung by a modern light vocalist. A vocalist who also, and with perfect ease, sang the blues, rather in the style of Tex and Jack Teagarden. Won't you come along with me To the Mississippi We'll take a boat to the land of dreams Steam down the river down to New Orleans With the band there to meet us All friends to greet us where all the black and white folks meet. Oh, this is Basin Street. Basin Street is the street where all the dark and light folks meet. The land of my dreams You'll never know how much it seems Or just how much it really means I'm glad to be Yes, Arie Where welcome's free And dear to me Where 
I can do My dear old vases feet blue But who was Alberti? Where did he come from? What sort of a fellow was he? Colin Bigby, one of the BBC's outside broadcast engineers, was a great friend of Alberti's. It must have been around 1928 when we used to broadcast Fred Elizalde and his music from the Savoy Hotel late at night that I met Alberti for the first time. He had come from Germany where he had been working in Munich but he was a South African by birth. Now, they say that most men are fond of their mothers, and Al most certainly was of his, for he brought that charming lady from South Africa to London to share in his successes and leisure moments. I soon struck up a friendship with him, for he was a happy-go-lucky chap to get along with, and we had a common interest in yachting. I kept a yacht down in Little Hampton during the 30s. She was a seven-ton catch, and Al would often come down whenever his engagements allowed and relax the board, entertaining us with his singing and guitar playing. I don't ever remember seeing him smoke, but he did like a drink or two. When we had anything or any excuse to celebrate, he used to produce a bottle of champagne, which he insisted on lowering over the side into the water to cool. Well, sometimes the water wasn't so cool. And then just as likely drink it out of a saucepan. We had great fun, but most of all, he loved to sing. He was always laughing and singing. You ought to be in pictures, you're wonderful to see. You ought to be in pictures, how beautiful you would be. Your voice would thrill a nation, your face would be adored. Why, you'd make a great sensation with wealth and fame, your reward. And if you should kiss the way you kiss when we are all alone, you'd make every girl and man a fan worshipping at your throne. You ought to shine as brightly as Jupiter and Mars. You ought to be in pictures, my star of stars. Lovely as a Crawford, like Davis, you're a gay. You surely should be offered a big starry part right away. You're sweet as a gainer, and you're as hot as the girl named West. You'd make even Garbo jealous if you took a movie test. You ought to dress like Colbert and ride in big motor cars. You ought to be in pictures, my stars are stars. That song, You Ought to Be in Pictures, from the film New York Town, was made in 1934. And Al was accompanied at the piano by Moniolita. Moniolita was Al's accompanist while he was appearing as a solo act on the variety halls. I met Al Bowley in 1925 in India at the Grand Hotel, Calcutta. I was then playing with an American band. The band leader was Jimmy Lee Quinn. Al wanted a job with us. He had come straight from the race course and was still in his riding outfit. He was a jockey at the time, one of the many odd jobs he had before he became famous as a singer. Anyway, he got a job with us in Calcutta and came with the band and we moved on to Singapore. We were a great success there, particularly Al, with his banjo and guitar. I can see him now, standing in front of the band, playing and singing through a megaphone. No microphones in those days. Such was our success that we stayed on in Singapore instead of going on to Shanghai as originally intended. After a year in Singapore, Al left for England, and I didn't see him till I arrived in London in 1933. He was then with Louis Stone at the Monsignor restaurant. A little later, we teamed up when Al went on the holes, top of the bill too. I particularly remember one occasion at the old Hoburn Empire. Al was stopped with the famous jazz trumpeter Louis Armstrong and the pianist Garland Wilson also on the bill. 
I owe him a great deal, for Al gave me my start in England. Al Bowley made his start in England with Fred Elizalde at the Savoy. But after that, things didn't go too smoothly for him. At one time, he even had to sing in the streets to pay his rent. And then, fortune smiled on him again in the spring of 1931, when he was given the chance to sing at the old Monsignor in Piccadilly with that great band led by the whispering cornetist Roy Fox, the band which included so many instrumentalists that have since become stars, Lou Stone, Nat Connella, Joe Crossman, amongst others. You are my heart's delight, and where you are, I long to be. You make my darkness bright, when like a star you shine on me. Time and my whole night through your light divine Bid me hope in you that dreams of mine May perchance come true And I shall hear you whisper I love you That was how I used to introduce the boys in the band when we went on the air from the Monsignor. And may I just say how pleased I am to be in this program in as much as I knew Al as well as I did. The record you have just heard was Al Bowie singing, You Are My Heart's Delight. Yes, he'd been with me about three months when we made that record. And I believe he was really anxious to get with my band when I first formed it. Because one day some of the boys in the band brought Al along and said, Roy, we want you to meet Al Bowie. We'd like to have you hear him sing. So I gave Alan an audition, and he got up there and sang for me, and not only did he have a great voice, but he had a most terrific smile and personality, and, well, it was almost impossible for me to say no, so I said yes. Well, when Al heard this, he came over and shook my hand, and I knew then that he really was very pleased to be with us. So much so that on his first payday, he took his check and said, come on, boss, let's go over and have a good feed. What do you say? And of course, he always called me boss. And so we went into Soho and Al, well, the, the dinner he ordered was really terrific. And I noticed when we came to the chicken, we finished this course off and I was waiting for his suite. And all of a sudden I heard sort of a crunch, crunch. And I looked across and here was Al sort of crunching on the bones and eating the bones. I said, what are you doing, Al? And said, well, boss, that's the best kind of chicken there is. He said, you don't know what you're missing. Well, anyway, I thought he must have had, well, wonderful teeth, so... Uh, oh, well, I could go on like this for hours and hours talking about Al Bowley because he was a wonderful fellow and he made such a wonderful success with the band in this country and became so well-loved. And to finish off, I'd just like to say Al was what I call a great guy. <laughs> And I shall hear you whisper, I love you. After Roy Fox had to give up the band through ill health, Lou Stone took it over and Al Burley continued to sing with him for some years, making a large number of records. Al was always in great demand for recording sessions, especially those directed by Ray Noble, who was musical director for one of the major recording companies and himself wrote a great number of hit songs. The very thought of you And I forget to do The little ordinary things That everyone ought to do I'm living in a kind of daydream I'm happy as a king And foolish though it may seem To me the 
touch everything The mere idea of you The longing near for you You'll never know how slow the moments go Till I'm near to you I see your face in every flower Your eyes in stars above It's just the thought of you The very thought of you My love Ray Noble now lives in Los Angeles, California, and it was in Los Angeles that he recorded his impressions, especially for this program. The first time I met Al Bowley was shortly after he had first arrived in London. I was on the lookout for promising new singers and gave him several recording dates. He was so anxious to get the opportunity, he said yes to everything. And it was some time before I discovered he was singing in too high a key for his best tones. Uh, following a summer engagement in Holland, I took Al to the States, where he became the featured singer with my band of what was then the most exclusive supper club in New York. He was already known there from our recordings, and his personal charm made new friends among the patrons. He was popular in the profession, too. The Tin Pan Alley men took to him at once. And so did musicians, even the somewhat taciturn and reserved Glenn Miller, who was my second trombonist, admitted that Al Bowley was a pretty good guy. Al himself was essentially a simple person. He saw the world only in black and white. If you were his friend, nothing was too good for you. If you were his enemy, well, look out. He was extremely generous and emptied his pockets to anyone with a hard luck story and was forever bringing some strange character to me with a plea that we do something to help, in spite of the fact that many of his swans turned out to be geese. In fact, to cope with this, my wife induced him to let her keep back some of his salary to forestall those who would uh, well, take advantage of his warm heart. Uh, this simple sincerity was, to me, the most valuable quality of his singing. He believed what he sang. Sometimes, when he had turned in a good performance on a song like The Very Thought of You, which has a lyric as sincere as I could make it, I've seen him turn away from the microphone with tears in his eyes. Oh, ballad singing is not, of course, a great art, but it's still no mean feat to catch at the hearts of thousands of listeners the way he could. It's just the thought of you, the very thought of you, my love. On his return from the States in 1936, Al Burley discovered that he had developed a wart on his vocal cords, which, unless he underwent a precarious operation, would mean the end of his career as a singer. He was told of a surgeon in New York who alone could carry this out with a chance of success. And so he sailed again to America in the autumn of 1937. The operation was successful. And while in the States, he recorded with his own special orchestra. <laughs> Never belong to me, but I can dream, can't I? Can't I pretend that I'm locked in a bend of your embrace? For dreams are just like wine, and I am drunk with mine. I'm aware my heart is a sad affair. There's much disillusion there. But I can dream, can't I? Can't I adore you all? Though we are oceans of heart. I can't make you open your heart, but I can dream, can't I? In the first week of 1938, Al Bowley arrived back in London to find recording contracts and radio appearances waiting for him. He sang with Morris Winnick's orchestra, the sweetest music this side of heaven, they call it then, but it was made sweeter by the new Bowley voice. 
Somebody's thinking of you tonight. Somebody's thoughts are blue tonight. Somebody's thinking they've made a mistake. Oh, what a difference a parting can make. Somebody's longing for you tonight, longing to hold you tight. What would you do, sweetheart, if you knew I'm thinking of you tonight? After the Munich War Scare in 1938, Al Burley recorded some songs with Geraldo's orchestra, often with his name on the label, and that was quite an honor in those days. Once I strayed beneath the window of a lovely senorita, and she smiled. While I softly played my penny serenade, si, 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 you can hear it for a penny. Si, 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 just a penny serenade. In her eyes. From the tender dawn of love and sweet surrender As for me In my heart I played a lover's serenade See, see, see Hear my love song for a penny Just a penny serenade For that night so divine She was mine Though no word had been spoken When I woke from my dream She was gone And my poor heart was broken Still I pray that wherever she may be, she will remember in her heart. She will always hear my penny serenade. When war came a year later in September 1939, Al, who was then 44, continued to record, broadcast, and entertain troops and war workers. He teamed up with Jimmy Messini, who also played the guitar, and together they toured the variety halls in bomb-scarred London. The radio stars with two guitars, they called themselves. On April the 2nd, 1941, they recorded a new number by Irving Berlin. When that man is dead and gone, when that man is dead and gone, we'll go dancing down the street, kissing everyone we meet when that man is dead and gone. What a day to wake up on, what a way to greet the dawn. Some fine day the news will flash Satan with a small moustache Is asleep beneath the lawn When that man is dead and gone Satan, Satan <laughs> Oh, top of land, dressed as a man Walk in the earth and since he began the world is hell for you and me. 
about what a heaven it will be. When that man is dead and gone, when that man is dead and gone, when they lay him twelve feet deep, I'll be there to laugh, not weep, when that man is dead. What a day to wake up on, what a way to greet the dawn. Satan will take him by the hand, to meet old Gurreen, look what man, when that man is dead and gone, when that man is dead and gone. When that man is dead and gone. The last record Al Burley ever made. Just two weeks later, in that April of 1941, a landmine fell near the German Street flat where Al lived. He probably knew nothing about it. He was killed instantly by the blast. I can well remember that last night of Al's life. He had been singing at a well-known Mayfair hotel, and in the early hours of the morning, he invited me for some supper at his German Street flat. I can well remember now, we had a Welsh rabbit made of gorgonzola cheese, which he cooked himself. It was indeed a rare sight in those days. I left within an hour, and shortly after, the landmine fell. But Al wouldn't want us to end a program of his music on a sad note, as his friend Colin Begbie, whom you've just heard, told us earlier. He was always laughing and singing, so let's remember him today with his version of that ever-popular... Night, sweetheart, one of the best known compositions by Ray Noble. So let's leave the last word on Al Bowley to him. Even after all these dangerous years, I still get many inquiries about Al Bowley. And sometimes when a middle-aged father says to me, you know, I first met my wife the night we danced to your band and heard Al Bowley sing Good Night, Sweetheart, and we've never forgotten it. Well, then I feel that both Al and I have contributed in our small way to other people's happiness. And how I wish he were here now to share that feeling. Good night, sweetheart. Sleep well back.